Well, this evening, uh, you know, of course, we're gathered here on, on this evening's time together to talk about, um, well, to talk about sin. Um, turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3. I love that we're going through Revelation on Sunday mornings. Not this coming Sunday. We'll, we'll talk about the resurrection specifically. But as we go through the book of Revelation, we see the consummation of all things, the restoring of all these things that ultimately were lost here. And so I'm going to read chapter 3, just really up to about verse, um, verse 15. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as, uh, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, or touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. There's the draw, right? Knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it uh, its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And I will admit to you at this point that I'm always interested in the inflection of God's voice as he sought out man. You know, there are those, by the way, who spend their entire Christian life thinking God said, Adam, where are you? I don't practice that, by the way, at home or anything. But, but then there are those who, who wonder if maybe God wasn't more calling out for Adam to take a moment, take stock, and show himself even in his fallen state. Adam, where are you? One day we'll find out. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave it from the tree, gave me from the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat in all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And of course, as he goes on, he begins to lay out the consequences of their fall. The women are, uh, the women are going to feel pain in childbirth from now on. And no longer will the field produce food uh, effortlessly, but rather by the sweat of man's brow it shall produce. And so in this moment, we see what is, what is called the fall. A fall from that position and place of enjoying the presence of God fully and deeply because of a choice, because of a temptation that was given into. So a few things here in the passage I'll just mention before we go further along. There's a passage uh, and that we just read where it, they realize that they're naked and God says, who told you you were naked? And some people stumble at that and say, well, how did you not know you were naked and all this kind of thing. But the truth of the matter is that in that moment, what's being pointed out there is that shame has now been introduced into man's experience something they'd never experienced before. God brought the woman to the man, they became one flesh, and so on. We understand the underpinnings of marriage in this. And there was nothing but purity, every thought, every action, pure, unadulterated, unfettered, unstained, until this moment. When the serpent engages with them and promises them something that he himself uh, gave a shot, God knows that when you eat of it, you'll not surely die, but rather you'll be like him. Wasn't that exactly what Satan's desire was? We talk about Satan's eye problems. You know, I will ultimately ascend to the hill of the Most High. I will ascend and be like him. Now, of course, we're all called to seek to be like him, to take on those 
those beautiful characteristics and properties of the nature of God in our lives. But Satan's was not one that was trying to emulate so much as to replace, to sort of move God off the throne. And that becomes ultimately the foundation for all sin in the world. Uh, pride at the root of it is maybe not so much overtly saying, God, get off your throne in word or in some kind of violent uprising, at least not yet. We see at the end of the book of Revelation, it's exactly that. But in our case right now, even today, there is a desire to supplant God and his will and instead insert ours instead. I will be like the Most High, not just to be like him, but rather to have insight like he has, which by the way is what that temptation was all about. Not just you will know good and evil, but you will have insight. The idea of you'll understand things like you didn't before. And a lot could be said simply about that temptation, but suffice to say that that ultimately forms the basis for all of the temptation that we find ourselves confronted with and sadly that we so often give in to. In John chapter 10, Jesus made the comment that the thief has only come to steal, to kill and destroy. I like the word only there. That means even in his temptation to try and sort of lead you down with what he wants you to think is a path of good and success and growth in some way actually is really intended to undermine and destroy. But Jesus went on to say, but I have come that they may have life and life to the full. There's a stark contrast there between what ultimately Satan is trying to give and what Jesus himself has come to give and actually can give. Peter warns us in his first epistle, chapter 5, that we should beware of the devil because he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour which means that we should understand that temptation lies at the door it lies at, is that me or is that the, it lies at the door it ultimately is something that will constantly be around the corner waiting for us to ultimately fall to I think that's next door actually and we'd be wise to be mindful of that why? Because our natural tendency is to go after such things. In the flesh, we are tempted because we want ultimately our way. We want to sort of be sovereign over our own lives. We want to have the last word. We want to do things in the way that we think is right, regardless of what God may have said. Because similar to what may have been part of the temptation is that we may feel like life could be better if we did it our way. You know, I wonder sometimes if, if Eve was sort of, if what was hinted at by Satan to Eve was that God's holding out on you. You know, oh, you're not going to die. No, 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 no. God knows that the, that, that the day you eat of it, you'll be like him. Well, we can't have that, right? So here, why don't you go ahead? You'll be like God. You'll have insight. You'll know God, good and evil and such. Well, again, the, the expression of that temptation may t take on somewhat different form for each of us. But the devil knows how to tweak those parts of our lives. He pays attention. He's not omniscient like God is. He doesn't know everything. And he's certainly not paying attention to every single human being. He's got plenty of minions to help him with that. But ultimately, what underlies temptation is the knowledge, or his attempts to tempt us, is the knowledge that we can be tempted. We have a fallen nature because of what just took place in Genesis chapter 3. And every one of us, is, uh, is, is of this same kind of a mindset and heart ultimately because of that. Innocence was gone and man was now fallen. Um, in Romans chapter 3, probably most of us can quote this verse, in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know this, right? The idea of sinning, for those who don't really think about the term, the idea of sin in English comes from an archery term. As a matter of fact, the idea that we adopted or that, that it was adopted in English really does still come from the Greek, the idea of missing the mark. But that idea found expression in archery when if you put a target on the wall and you, you took a shot at it and you missed the bullseye, you sinned. You missed the mark. You didn't hit the perfect bullseye. Now, of course, transgression kind of carries on and says, okay, the target's over there. Who cares? I'm shooting this way. That's like, I don't care where the target is. I'm going to shoot at what I want. That's transgression. But sin implies the idea that, or sinning or missing the mark, implies the idea that you're trying to hit it, but you can't. You gave it your best shot, and you still missed. 
Now, we're guilty of sin and transgression, both rebellion and transgression, deciding to do things our way because that's just how we want it. God, you said this, I'm going to do this. But we're also guilty of sin. Even when we try, we still, in the flesh, fall short. And that the word fall short means exactly that. It means that you were shooting for a goal, but you didn't quite get there. And therefore, because all of us have sinned, past tense, have sinned, which, by the way, we were born into this mess. You didn't become a sinner at some point in your life. I don't know if you knew that or not. But you were born in sin. We entered the world with a negative balance on the ledger to start with. Our nature is tainted by virtue of just being human. Because in Adam, as Paul would say to the Corinthians, in Adam, all die. Death is the result of sin. The reason we ultimately get old, the reason we ultimately pass away off the scene, is because of sin. And it's important for us to understand this about ourselves. We're not good people that sort of go off the rails once in a while. You might be nicer than your neighbor. You might be a better person than I am. Odds are in your favor. But at the end of the day, we're all in the same predicament. We are sinners. Paul makes this clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody has escaped this. As a matter of fact, just to sort of put a fine point on this, Jesus, when talking about some particular kinds of sin, gets beyond the activity and really gets to the point. He says, you have heard it said that you shall not commit, it, uh, commit murder. But I say to you, if you hate someone in your heart, you've as well as committed murder. You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. Why? Because that action, that expression, ultimately is born from something that exists within us. We are in this predicament, and all that the outward expression of sin does is magnify or expose the fact that that's what we are. Frank Peretti, how many of you have ever read any of his books? Frank Peretti is a famous author from years ago. I don't think he's, I don't even know if he's alive anymore, actually, but he hasn't written in a while, not that I know of. But, um, uh, Oh, and now I forgot what he said. <laughs> It'll come to me. But, <laughs> wow. It was so anyway, but we're all in this predicament. We're all, oh, I know what it was. How many of you ever had to teach your kids how to be selfish? Nobody, right? It's in us. That's just a raw example. Now here, I don't know if I shared this, this before, but in our old church in Illinois, uh, I won't say the name because I don't want to embarrass them, but it's, um, you wouldn't know them anyway. But one day their, their son, their, who was a young man at the time, uh, church was over, we we're all just hanging out talking, and all of a sudden he comes running in from the hallway, pointing back at some kid down the hall saying, kill him, kill him. You know, and of course you're mortified by that, but it's kind of hilarious in a way to think that such rage could exist in a little kid, you know. But that was a pretty raw expression of what really resides within us, you know? I mean, it, not to be mean about it, but that is exactly what Jesus was talking about. And that kind of thing resides within us. We're doomed to that. That's what we are. And as Paul would also say in Romans, the wages of sin is death, right? You and I are doomed on our own to receive the wages of what we've done. That is our predicament. That is the situation that we are in. Now, that's the bad news. But even as Paul would say that even though we're all in sin, the wages of sin being death, the gift of God is eternal life. Back in Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, before God began to pronounce the judgments, He already began to talk about, or as he's pronouncing the judgments, he, he brings out the idea that there is going to be a solution to this in the person of a savior, the seed of the woman who will ultimately, ultimately come. Satan would go after his heels 
but this Savior would ultimately bruise and crush this serpent's head. And so in spite of the bad news, or even in the midst of the expressing of that bad news, in the midst of that bad news unfolding ultimately in the garden, we find that God is already making known that there is a solution coming down the road. There is an answer to the problem, the predicament that we're all in. And this becomes the whole purpose of why Jesus came. In the same way that Adam sort of started the ball rolling for all of us to be in the predicament we're in, Jesus came to ultimately reverse that. In Adam, in, in Adam all die, but in Christ there is eternal life. He came to rectify, to right that which was wronged all the way back in the garden. Our predicament goes back to our first parents, and therefore we are what we are. It's entered the world, we are what we are, fallen completely. And once again, just to kind of drive it home a little further, we are helpless. As a matter of fact, you and I, and the scriptures make this very clear. You and I have no ability to change our predicament in and of ourselves. We cannot do enough to fix the wrong that we've done because it's not just about the wrong we've done. It's because of what we are. Therefore, we cannot fix it ourselves. Can a leopard change its spots, the prophet would say. No, we can't. We are doomed. As a matter of fact, to borrow from the idea of a leper, leprosy in the Bible is often seen and should be seen as a type of sin. It's the kind of thing that there is no real cure for. And here's the thing about leprosy, much like sin. Leprosy tends to dull the nerves until you become unfeeling in that part of your body. And so therefore, it's not so much that you die of leprosy, as much as you die of the consequences of leprosy. In other words, it's like this. When, the reason that we slap our kid's hand away when they're about to touch the stove is because they might burn themselves. They might hurt themselves. If we weren't there and they touched it, their nerves would tell them, right? Even if you and I weren't there, their nerves would tell them something bad is going on. You need to react. You need to move away from it. Well, if the nerves in your hand start to die because of the leprosy, you could literally put your hand on the stove and not know what was going on until you began to smell the flesh burning. That's gross, right? Yeah. But that's how it works. Sin is a lot like that. Your conscience, the law of God, if you know the law of God, if you're familiar with what God has said is right and wrong, or even just in your conscience, as Paul would say in Romans, to those of us who weren't given the law like the Jews were, even our consciences tell us about this. But if our conscience becomes, matter of fact, the expression is seared like a hot iron, right? The seared is with a hot iron. If our consciences, if our sense of what's right and wrong, if our understanding of the law, if these things begin to sort of uh, fade away because we are giving in to sin, our sense of what is right and wrong, our morality begins to suffer as a result of that, we become numb ultimately to sin. We stop reacting like we would initially. When you and I came to Christ, hopefully we're a lot alike in this regard, but we didn't want to do anything that displeased the Lord. You know, We wanted to do what he wanted. We were reading our Bibles voraciously. What did God say about this? Okay, if I'm doing something, if I'm living in a lifestyle that is, is wrong and everything, I don't want to do that anymore because I know that God said that's wrong. I want to please him. I want to serve him. But then I start getting a little older in the Lord, and I start finding ways to kind of straddle the fence a little bit. And my sense of morality starts to get a little numbed. I start kind of putting up with things, and this isn't so bad. And then I kind of eventually just start living in certain ways that are clearly displeasing to God, but I don't care anymore, right? That's what sin does. It numbs us to the potential harm that can come by walking in sin. I'm not talking about our salvation at this point for believers, if you're a believer today. But believers can sort of get so laxed in their relationship with Christ that they no longer really live for him anymore. Paul interestingly said, you know, essentially he died for me, so I'm going to live for him. That just kind of goes part and parcel with what it means to walk with Jesus. When you love somebody, you want to please them. You want to make them happy with what you're doing and that kind of stuff. You want to be faithful. But sin has a way of sort of numbing that. And all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What that means is 
is that the things we do are the consequence of sin's grip on us and its numbing power to ultimately undermine. But again, that's why Jesus came. That's why he came into the world. In the same way that in Adam all die, in Christ now everlasting life, restoration, right relationship with God. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, they sinned, they experienced shame, they sought to hide from God. You know, the whole fig leaf thing and everything, we think that looks silly and we imagine the Sunday school pictures and all that kind of thing. What it really means is that they recognize their nakedness and they tried to cover it up themselves. They recognized shame and they tried to deal with it on their own terms to somehow find a way to sort of cover up. Lord, oh man, I just feel guilty. I need to cover things up. I need to somehow deal with this and everything. And they hide from God because that's what sin does. We don't want to get close to God because he'll expose that. He'll see it for what it is. And we're ashamed. But God said that wouldn't do. It's God who went after man, by the way. You notice that. They didn't go looking for God and say, how do we fix this? No, they hid. It was God who went finding them and said, let me fix this. Their attempt to cover themselves would not do, both practically speaking, but also typologically, metaphorically. And so God takes skins and covers them. He himself takes care of their need to be covered. Where did those skins come from? Animals, right? I don't know if you ever asked yourself that question. There's blood involved. We begin to see now, from the very beginning, this example that follows all the way through Scripture, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And there becomes this growing picture of this one who would ultimately come, why he would come, what he would do when he came, in that model. As a matter of fact, all of the offerings that would be offered throughout Israel's history were all intended in some way especially the Passover offering, but all offerings in some way were meant to point to the person of Christ ultimately. But just for a moment to key in on the Passover sacrifice. When did Passover start? Not this week or anything like that, but when did Passover begin? Exodus, right? Here they were. God had just brought the plagues upon the Egyptians, and now he was about to bring the tenth and most devastating plague, the death of the firstborn. However, he made provision for his people, or for that matter, anybody who would do what he was prescribing. And what he prescribed was is to take the lamb that would be offered during that night, and they would slit the throat of that animal, the blood would fall into a basin, they would take a hyssop branch, and they would strike the doorpost, the lentil, by the way, is sort of the top part of the doorpost, but they would smite it with this hyssop branch, and blood would smatter on this, and the angel of death that God was going to send to take the firstborn that night would pass over those houses that had been covered by the blood. In other words, deliverance came by the shedding of blood. And thus the picture was now clearly, literally painted on the doorposts of their home. And that's why when Jesus finally comes on the scene and John the Baptist sees him coming, he says, behold the what? Lamb of God who takes away the sin, collectively, singular, all the sin, the sin of the world. That picture is now complete in him. I forget the name of the person who gave us this quote, but he said that Jesus was so bent on our salvation by the offering of himself that he actually created the tree that he would hang on and he nurtured from birth the men who would one day crucify him on that accursed tree. The gospel is rooted in the love of God. What I've been painting a picture of, or trying to in any way, is to demonstrate what our predicament really is. Now, does anything about what I described in terms of our rebellion, our seeking to hide ourselves, our wanting our own way, our asserting our own will over God's, does any of that sound particularly lovable? Anything sound like a good quality in any of that? No, we try to help our children not live that way so that they will do what's right. Well, imagine God looking upon a world that is as bent in rebellion as Jesus was in saving. And imagine, we can't of course imagine, but imagine being so holy and so pure and looking upon the sin of the world 
recognizing our predicament and not walking away and saying, forget it. But instead, not just making a way, but the particular cost that God was willing to pay for redemption. That he might be glorified in his love and grace and mercy and that you and I, rebels, would be saved. It's important that we never stop understanding, acknowledging, even I would suggest thinking about just how opposed to God we were in our sin. There was no redeeming quality to us that elicited the redemption. It was all about him, his grace, and his love. There was a teacher years ago named Robert Schuller. Uh, some of you are familiar with this name. Robert Schuller once talked about how the cross sanctifies the ego trip. What that means is that the cross is sort of to be taken as being an example of just how worth saving we were. Because after all, you don't pay more than something is worth, right? Oh my God, how do you ever come away from the cross with that? How do you ever turn the cross so completely on its head as to think that somehow that's, that God was doing that because we deserved it. It's horrifying. It's the, mo it's the most rank kind of heresy about the cross that you can almost imagine. No, the cross does not demonstrate what we're worth. The cross demonstrates the love of God and how great it is in spite of how little we're worth. We don't deserve that. None of us deserve that. None of us deserve God's mercy and grace. Not a one of us has any redeeming quality whatsoever in and of ourselves. God didn't save us because there was something worth saving. God saved us because that's who he is. That's his grace. That's his abundant love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Everything about that starts and is initiated with God, not with us. For God so looked upon this world of worthy sinners. I thought, you know, it's too bad they messed up a little bit. Let me fix that for them. No. If that's what we think, then we are missing the beauty of the gospel. What magnificent love is it that in Christ God would reconcile mankind and not hold our sins against us? You and I can barely let go of each other's sins. Imagine God looking at the whole world laden in sin and rebellion and being willing not just to sort of turn a blind eye to it, but to pay for it. He who knew no sin became sin with our sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Talk about the most beautiful transfer that could ever be imagined. He who knew no sin Jesus saw sin, he lived in a world of sin, but he knew no sin. I can't even imagine what that's like. And neither can you, by the way, don't laugh at me. But none of us can imagine. What's it like to never have a wrong thought? What's it like to always have a right motivation? What's it like to always do the right thing and never hesitate? What's, I, I can't even, you know? Jesus had none of what I... He personally had nothing of that which is, resides in me freely. And he became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That he might take his righteousness, God's righteousness, and give it to us. Wow! I, I'm fairly certain that most of us don't spend the kind of time, and myself included, of just how grand of a gift that actually is. God has given his righteousness now in Christ to you and I, which means that as a believer, if you are here today and you are a child of God, born again, bought and paid for by the blood of Christ, what that means is, is that God no longer looks at you like, it, like you're covered in sin anymore. He sees you through the righteousness of Christ now. I can't even imagine that. Like I'm still what I am, although I now have a new nature, but I'm still in the flesh. 
But God doesn't see me that way. It's mind-boggling. Why would we ever diminish the cross by making it seem like we're worth all this? No, we need to understand how beautiful God's love and grace and the redemption really is. It is so far-reaching and so absolutely overwhelming that it frankly ought to just become all-consuming to us. Such is the love of God. I quoted John 3.16 for a moment, and on uh, Sunday we'll take a little bit more of a look at 1 Corinthians 15. But in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, I declare to you, or some of your versions will say, I remind you, brethren, of the gospel that I preached to you, that Jesus came according to the scriptures, and that he died and rose again according to the scriptures. He came into the world, he died for our sins, he rose from the dead. That is probably the most potent and simple explanation of the gospel that there is in, this, in the scripture. But the beating heart of the gospel is clearly John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Again, we have trouble loving each other. Perfect holiness, loving the world, is staggering and mind-boggling. And so much did he love the world that he was willing to give his only begotten son. Such a price cannot be imagined. The high, the, no higher gift could be given. But it was God who gave, God who initiated, God who freely of his own love gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe. He didn't even ask us to do something Magnificent. We didn't have to climb a mountain. We didn't have to, uh, to do some feat of incredible devotion to demonstrate uh, our, willing, our, our willingness to be saved. No, believe. Romans chapter 4, verse 5 says that he who believes but does not have works is still justified. Faith is not a work. Putting your trust in Jesus is not a work. It's simply the response of God's grace being shown to us, poured out to us, the invitation being given. All of the hard work, all of the heavy lifting, everything that it cost was paid for by him. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if anyone believe in him, anyone, if you're here today as a non-believer, you do not have to leave as a non-believer. Because the invitation is to you. Such is God's love for you, even though you're in your current condition. Whoever believes in him would not perish, would not be separated from the grace of God for all eternity, but rather spend an eternity in a place created for the devil and his angels, not for you and I. But nonetheless, those who tie their cart to that horse, that is where, that's where they go. But instead have everlasting life. Such love can't, certainly can't be expressed in a half an hour. There's no end to the words and the adjectives and the description and the, the outpouring of thanksgiving and the worship that such love evokes. And that's why for millennia, people have been trying to find ways to express their gratitude for such love. And in heaven, we will be spending eternity loving God in response to his love for us. In 1 Corinthians 15, where it does say again, this is the gospel, that Christ came, that he died according to the scriptures, that he rose again according to the scriptures. This is one of the earliest, possibly the earliest creed in the church where it simply expresses the gospel. But it ultimately expresses, it is, it is in itself, I should say, an expression of something Jesus himself said. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Now, there are a number of things about that statement that ought to be considered. First of all, it's very narrow. Let's not pretend it isn't. It is. Jesus said he himself, not some set of rules, not some eight noble tenets or anything like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Think about that. I am the way at the exclusion of all others. The truth, capital T, right? 
the truth at the exclusion of all other pretenders and the life, eternal life, life that is not only lengthy in terms of eternity, but as a quality of life is ultimately what's in view in that statement. The idea of aeonia soe, the idea of eternal life, that, that sense of this, this fullness and richness of life, not just longevity, but quality. Jesus is those things. That's why he could say to, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live, right? I am that. Not just if you do the right sequence and order of things that I've taught. It's wrapped up in him personally. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by me, except through me. Forgive me, you've no doubt, some of you here have heard me say this example before. If you've been to the nursing home with us, you've heard me say it about a hundred times. Um, but for, by way of an example, and I'll wrap up with this. If, God forbid, something, a fire broke out here in the building. Now, this is a dark room and there's no windows, right? Suppose a fire broke out, smoke began to somehow fill the room, and none of us could see anything. People are panicked. They're looking for a way out, but nobody can seem to find the door. Everybody's tripping on each other. Of course, I'm sure we'd be very orderly in that way and trying to help our neighbor. But, um, but, you know, the idea that we couldn't see anything, filled with smoke, darkness, and we know the fire is coming. Doom is at the door. And all of a sudden, a fireman kicked open the door. The one, well, we have a big door over here, by the way, that we would open to get out, by the way, if you're wondering, what would we do in a fire? <laughs> That big door would be a great way to get out, so we'll just lift it up and go. But, um, but suppose it was just that door in the back. Suppose that was the only one. And a fireman kicked it open and said, come with me if you want to live. Let me ask you, show of hands. How many of you would say, you know, that just seems awfully narrow-minded? You know, I, I've kind of got my own idea on how this whole thing should work and how I can get out of here and stuff. I, that's your truth. <laughs> My truth, you know. Anybody? Show of hands? Anyone going to do that? No, probably not, right? We would say, okay, and we'd go. And we would be thankful that there was one way. We wouldn't be arguing, saying, well, that's not right. That seems narrow. We should have a hundred ways. The truth is, if there was a thousand ways, we'd still want more. If ours wasn't one of the thousand, we'd argue that my way should be in that list, too. No, we would go, A, because safety, B, because fireman, he understands this kind of stuff. I can trust him. He knows. He's done this. This is how you're saved. Okay, well, the world is collapsing under the weight of its sin. It is collapsing and it is destroying itself, and one day it will end. Jesus kicked open the door and said, come with me if you want to live. And yet somehow, mankind says, no, that's too narrow-minded. You know why? Because people don't know the predicament they're in. Because people don't realize that they're actually dead in their sin. They have no hope of saving themselves. They have no ability, no capacity, no power to do it themselves. But Jesus, who has risen from the dead who knows what eternity is all about, sees inside of our hearts and knows what we're made of, and yet nonetheless has come to set us free, we should just say, yes, Lord, lead the way. Absolutely. Just like we would hang on that fireman's coattails, just lead me out of here, so too we would be wise to fall on our faces and say, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to come to the Father, and I understand it's by you, what do I need to do? What do I need to believe? What is it, you know? And, and we would do it. We should do it. We should understand that. Well, what is that? What do we do? What do we say? What do we believe? We believe what Jesus said about himself and what he accomplished for us on the cross. It is in Christ and in Christ alone that man has hope. We'll talk more about this on Sunday because after all, today's just Friday, but Sunday's coming, right? So we'll spend more time on that then. Just as John records, if we believe, if we put our trust in Christ alone, 
What that means is not just that we don't believe in some other world religion. It certainly means at least that. But it, for most of us, it means something much deeper than that. It means we no longer rely on ourselves. It means we lay down our arms, we lay down our game plan, we lay down our sense of what is ultimately true in regard to a right relationship with God. We set it down and we say, you know something? I'm going to leave this here because you're the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. My ideas are irrelevant. My particular bent on how we, this should all work makes no difference whatsoever. Ultimately, if you are the way, the truth, and the life, then my answer is simply, take me. I'm yours. Now, for any in here today who have never come to that place and said, Lord, Jesus, thank you for paying for my sins. You took them on the cross and you paid for every last one of them. In fact, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for just a moment. Second Corinthians chapter five. And in particular, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn our attention to verse 17 to start. Where Paul writes to these Corinthian believers, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all of these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, or this is what I'm saying, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He goes on to explain then that we are ambassadors for Christ, making the appeal that you be reconciled to God. And then in verse 21, he says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus took every sin that you and I have ever committed and paid for them on the cross. I always have to ask this question just so we kind of get our minds around this. How many of your sins and mine were future when the cross happened? Every one of them. Every last sin that you and I ever committed, paid for at the cross. All that remains is for you to simply receive that gift, that grace. It's done. It is finished. And what I'd like to do as we close is give an opportunity for anybody who has never come to that place of receiving that gift today to receive it. Now you might be saying to yourself, okay, well, that sounds awfully easy. So I just pray this prayer and everything's wonderful? Well, I didn't say anything about wonderful. Um, sometimes life can be very hard for Christians just like it is for non-Christians. I'm not going to lie to you about that. As a matter of fact, sometimes it can be even harder because the world that you're living in as a believer is completely opposed to that which you hold most sacred and dear. And you have to live with that and find a way to actually be a testimony of those around you, hopefully. But as far as doing, let me tell you a secret about grace. This is probably the most misunderstood element of what it means to be saved. Most people, including anyone in here right now who's not a Christian, believes that if I do enough of the right things, I can earn a right relationship with God. How many of you grew up believing in the scale analogy, right? If I do enough good deeds, they outweigh my bad, I'm in. That's not how it works. That is not how it works at all. As a matter of fact, Jesus, or I should say Paul, in referring to the cross, said, look, if righteousness came by the law, or if by doing all those good deeds, if that's how you were made righteous with God, then Jesus didn't have to come. It was pointless, needless. That's not how it works. So where do works, good works, fit in? They're our response. When you love somebody, like we said at the beginning, when you love somebody, you want to make them happy. You want to do things that bless them. You want to live in a way consistent with their character and nature and personality. You want to learn about them. You want to find out what it is that blesses their heart and you want to live that way. Will you still sin after you become a Christian? Yeah, sadly it's true. We still do. Paul, I'm realizing I've been walking with the Lord almost 30 years now. 
which means I've been walking with the Lord about as long as Paul was when he wrote the book of Romans. Not that I have anything in common with the depth of Paul, but it strikes me that 30 years in, Paul was still talking about how the things that he wants to do, the flesh seems to keep him from doing, and the things he doesn't want to do, that's what he finds himself doing. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Are we capable of sinning? Yes, certainly. But one day, we'll enjoy that victory that comes in that next verse with that, that victory cry, I thank God in Christ Jesus my Lord, right? And he goes on to talk about the idea of not walking according to the flesh, but rather walking according to the Spirit or in step with the Spirit. That comes as the result of the change that takes place within us. We just read it in Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. It would be in a brand new life. Living by the grace of God, standing upon the grace of God with the, with the knowledge that one day we will be free of the battle that we deal with every day and then our flesh. It will be over because we're His now. So let me invite you, if you've never come to that point of receiving that gift of God and giving your life over to Him, just handing it over. Lord, I'm done. I'm done doing this my way. I'm yours now. Let me, let me invite you to pray. Father, we just want to come before you and thank you for a time like this to consider the gospel ultimately accomplished, fully satisfied in the person of Christ and his death on the cross and then ultimately his resurrection. We thank you that Jesus was willing to take that which we deserved, so completely deserved, and yet took it all upon himself. Such love, it's hard to even describe. So all we will do is say thank you for this. And we ask you to just make the reality of your deep love for us. And the picture of the cross is the example of this. To ultimately just ignite our hearts to live our lives for you. In loving response to the love you've shown us. And Father, for those who are here today that have never come and received this beautiful, gracious gift that you have offered rebels to come and have a clean slate to start over, to become a child of the King, a follower of Jesus, with a living hope that lies in wait in eternity, but also the power to live a new life here today. Father, we thank you that in Christ you have paid for our sins. And now you invite us to come and to know you. If you're here today, I want to invite you, if, you're not, if you've never come to that point, once again, that you join me in prayer now and stop running away and rather receive the gift of God of eternal life in Christ. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. You've known this my whole life, and even from all eternity past, you knew what I would be. And nonetheless... You loved me anyway. Father, I thank you for the gift of your grace. I thank you for the forgiveness that you accomplished for me in Christ on the cross, where he died for my sins once and for all. And I thank you that he rose from the dead. And I understand now that there is life, eternal life, that awaits me. Thank you for your forgiveness and your grace. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to walk in a way that blesses you and pleases you and glorifies you until I see you face to face. Thank you for your grace and goodness toward me. In Jesus' name, amen.